Yeah, welcome to J Prime. Um, yay! So I'm really honored to be here. So it's uh, I always love it if a user group organizes a conference, and then th it looks really professional to me. So and I saw a lot of conferences. So it's really great job, guys. Really nice. Woohoo! Uh, the topic today is, uh, yeah, catch me if you can. Now, I will explain the title, it's a little bit strange. And to be honest, this is always to get something through the call of papers. You need a really nice uh, title. And the real title is Java on Wearables, right? So, um, but there is a story behind that. Um, because I'm working for Oracle, I have to show you this slide. You read it carefully. Okay, you're done. Um, <laughs> So about me, just a few words. My name is Gerhard Grunwald. I'm coming from Germany, working for Oracle as a so-called now developer evangelist. And um, I'm also a jack leader, so I know what it means to create something like this. And it's really kudos to the organizing team that this is really awesome. And they did it. If I got it right, they started in February. And now we have May. So this is really awesome. But uh, now to the topic. Wearables. I think, who knows what a wearable is? Yeah, I, I think all of you, right? Um, and it's not this stuff. But um, I tried to, to figure out a little bit of a description. What is a wearable? And uh, I came up with, with this. So it, it's a miniature electronic device. So it should be small, OK? Then it's worn under, with, or on top of clothes in the ideal case. Right? Um, the ideal case is you, you wouldn't even know that you wear it. That would be really perfect, but we are not there yet. And it needs more computational logic than um, some hardware-coded logic. So that means uh, you need a CPU to, to calculate some stuff, to maybe do some data analysis, to upload data to the internet, something like that. So it's not done with just a simple electronic uh, circuit. So this is, I think, it, it, it describes roughly what a wearable is, or what it should be. And some examples that you, I think you, you know some of them, so like uh, Google Glass, and I'm, I'm still waiting for these guys here. They are really nice earphones, and um, that was a Kickstarter project. It's a German company. And these guys can, they are water resistant. They, you can play music with them. They will track your heartbeat, and I don't know what else. So it's really awesome stuff. Uh, watches like this, which is just something, it's not really a real watch, and, and, and insoles. This is nice for runners, for example. Who's a runner here on a regular basis? So that means you, you might be interested in stuff like that, right? Because it calculates the pressure on your feet, and then it can correct your running style and give you some hints what you can do better and stuff like that. So, it, of course, they can count steps and... So it's really a nice idea. And then clothing, like on the right side, like trousers or shirts. I think that the company is called Hexaskin or Hexoskin, and they do really amazing stuff. Um, the use cases, I think it's clear. We have fitness and health tracking, which is mainly data producing. That means these guys just collect data and produce the data. So that, that's all what they do. And I think this is the main target at the moment for all these devices. And so I have to tell you a little story, because, you know, the IoT and, and all this fitness track, tracking stuff, is, it's the total hype at the moment. Everybody has this fitness tracker on the wrist and counting steps and really great. I was visiting a farm the last weekend, and uh, it was mass animal production, and so they have cows, and they produce milk. And then I saw on each cow, and they have 250 of them, I saw a little blue box on the leg. And I said, oh, what's that? So I asked the guy, and he said, oh, yeah, that's a pedometer. I said, on the cow? <laughs> he said, sure. So what are you doing with that? Oh, we count if the cow is moving, if she's lying, if she's in the box, and, and all that stuff. And which box, it's always the same. And I said, oh, that's great. And then they analyze it, and then they can uh, calculate from the analyzing, they can calculate if the cow is pregnant and all that stuff from the behavior. So I asked, wow, that's quite new. No, no, we use it since 1998. So I was like, <laughs> okay, but IoT, yeah, the new hype. So it's not really that new. And so because this is a totally different area, I never heard of, but it's, it's fascinating that this is standard, and they did it for years, and it, it's, it works. So then we have... Um, Devices like location tracking, 
right? So you have some, something like a GPS device, uh, calculates where you are, where you would like to go. This is uh, data producing and consuming, right? It also consumes data uh, because you put something in and then it calculates uh, results. And uh, then we have informational stuff. This is this augmented reality thing where you go around and then you take your phone because a phone in principle is a wearable, right? It's not a big difference. You have nearly the same processors, you have memory, it's just a little bit bigger, and it has a connection to the internet, which most of the wearables have not, unfortunately, which is a problem of batteries. Um, so this is the normal use cases. And all these devices have also requirements. And the requirements, I mentioned that already, it's a small form factor, right? So it should be very small, lightweight, and unobtrusive. That means, like I said, the best thing is if you don't even know that you wear it, then it's perfect. Then you need smart power management, which is the hardest part, uh, because electronics developed very fast the last 10 years. Batteries, unfortunately, not. Maybe it will be better with, with Tesla going on with new battery technologies, but at the moment, it's, uh, this is the big problem is battery life. You know it from your smartphone, sometimes it doesn't even uh, give you power for one day, right? You have to recharge during the day. So then you need stuff like uh, low power consumption of the electronics, sleep mode, auto shutdown, all these things, and of course a rechargeable battery. And um, the hardest part is its uh, connectivity, because if you would like to, to use that data that you collect, then you would also like to analyze it somehow, somewhere. So the best would be upload it to the internet and then analyze it from wherever you are. That, that would be ideal. And there are different ways how to do it. Cheap fitness trackers have a USB cable, you plug it in your computer and then download the data and so on. Then you have Bluetooth, Unplus, who knows what Unplus is? Ah, I always ask that. You are a runner, right? No? Ah, oh, okay. Biker? Ah, okay. <laughs> because uh, Unplus is very similar to Bluetooth technology-wise. Uh, and it's also nice, but uh, it doesn't really is that uh, widespread like Bluetooth is. Okay, so and if we take a look at the current situation, then we have lots of devices from thousands of vendors, and they all have their features. Some can track heartbeat, some can track steps, whatever you like. And there is no real standard, right? So Apple has its own stuff, Google has its own stuff, Microsoft has its own stuff. Everything's nice but you can't really combine that. So, for example, I have a, a Google Wear watch. It doesn't have something like heart rate counting. So what should I do? Buy an Apple Watch to get heart rate? This is, that's really a problem. So you, you won't get something that, is, that covers everything. And it's, uh, if you need something special, then uh, you have only one, one solution at the moment. You have to do it yourself. So, right? so this is... Uh, that was just the introduction to my idea that uh, was born two years ago at Erdev, which is a conference in, in Sweden, and that was a JRunner project. So, and now we come to the catch me if you can stuff. Um, I was talking to two friends of mine, and we discussed with uh, a lot of beers uh, that it would be nice because one of the guys was an ultra marathon runner, or is. And this is two years ago, so at that time we, we didn't have Apple Watch, Google Wear, so it we had some simple fitness trackers, and we thought about it would be nice to, to track a runner live with data like where is the runner, how fast is the runner, what is the heart rate, and give him maybe some advice live, so something like, oh, be aware there will be someone on the road for you, give you something, something to drink or something like that. Or the weather, the weather will be bad within five kilometers, so something like that. That was the idea. And um, I had some, some features, some ideas for features. So the first thing was, uh, I need GPS data, sure. That's for the location you need that stuff. Then heart rate is something very important for, for running or for every kind of sport. Then because my device, and this is the device, the, the current state of the device, um, has no display, uh, I, I thought about, okay, how can I get some feedback from my device? So. Uh, then I, had a, I also have a, an Android phone, and there you can define something like vibration sequences. So I thought, oh, that's nice. Something like SOS, if the battery goes down, right? You can, you can recognize if you have the thing uh, 
somewhere close to the, to the skin, and you will recognize the, the, the different uh, seam, uh, schemes from, from vibration. So I need vibration feedback. Then th this is <laughs> a little bit special. Uh, I thought about, wouldn't it be nice if I can sit at home and send a message to the runner, and the device will read the message to the runner? So text-to-speech. Uh, yeah, like I said, ideas. Uh, we will come to, to the solution. Then something very simple like an on switch, an automatic shutdown. So who has a Raspberry Pi here? Uh, and who used a Raspberry Pi? Not just lying around on the desk. <laughs> yeah, so um, then you know that there is nothing like an on switch on a Raspberry Pi in the standard, standard version. So you can solder one. And uh, there is also no off switch. So, and if you have a box like this, switching it on, you, have, you need some, something to switch it on, right? It sounds so simple, but it's not. It's not that easy. And by the way, when I arrived yesterday, you see this is a black box with a red button on it. You can imagine if you have airport security. And yesterday in Berlin, they, they took me out, and I know that already. And then he said, oh, what's that? Uh, it's a computer. Oh, no, that's not a computer. <laughs> Say, yeah, it is. No, no, my computer looks totally different. <sighs> Okay, so I started to explain GPS sensor. And then, oh, but what's the red button? I said, no, no, don't press it. And he was like, oh, oh, why, why? I said, oh, ah, uh, yeah. And then I tried to explain. When I switch it on, I need to start my phone or something to switch it off again. Uh huh. Okay. So uh, yeah, lesson learned: never build a black box with a red button. It's not good. So it's really it was a bad idea. <laughs> So, but yeah, I needed that. Then, um, if you have a battery inside, you need to monitor the battery. Sounds easy, but it's not, right? So, uh, because you have to find a way to figure out if the battery is going down the drain, and at a certain point, you have to switch it off. Otherwise, the battery will suffer. So, this is a lithium polymer battery inside, and you don't have to uh, drain it till 0%. Then the battery will suffer. So, you really have to switch it off 10, 15% before it's, uh, it's empty. So you have to do that somehow. And uh, because it has no display, I need a remote control to do that. So this is the features that I uh, tried to implement. And the whole thing is running on this device. Um, do you, did someone know that? Does someone know that device? Awesome. Because this is, this is the really best device that I know. Um, I started with a Raspberry Pi, and I told you it's really a lot of things you have to do, and it gets like that size after all. So it's wearable. Right? I can also take my notebook in the backpack, and then it's also wearable. But it was not really a solution. So then I stumbled upon this board, which is hardware-wise, and I will come to the specifications uh, later. It is, in principle, a Pi, but it's smaller. It's, in this case, the whole thing, with battery, with all the stuff. And it comes like this, without any uh, headers soldered. So you really can decide if you need a USB port, you have to solder it on the, on the device. But that makes it really small. And I use, to, to run that, I use Java Embedded, SE8 Embedded. So um, you can also use ME8 to do that. But to be honest, SE8 was for me more comfortable because I can create the whole code on my desktop and then create the jar there, just put it on the device, and it works. Which makes it, you can also do that with ME, but I'm more an SE guy, so I, I really like that. It's, and you can lose, use lambdas and all that stuff in, in your code, which makes it very convenient. So to keep that up front, Java was not the problem. That's easy. That, that, the coding is no problem. Getting, it, getting the right sensors and really make it as small as possible, that's the problem. So when we start with sensors, then you should know this project. Who knows this project for Raspberry Pi? If you do hardware development with a Raspberry Pi with Java, this is the only way to go. So this is uh, the Pi4j project is a wrapper around uh, the wiring Pi library, which is a C library that uh, makes it possible to connect all to, the, to all the, the GPIO pins and everything that is available on the Pi. And this is just a, a nice uh, Java wrapper around that. And it makes it so easy to use uh, a hardware access with the Pi. And because this board is comp compatible to the Pi, that was the, the best way to use it. And let's start with tracking and location. One thing, so usually I give this session, and it's two to two and a half hours long, because I, I tried five different GPS sensors. 
And you, may, you might think a GPS sensor is a GPS sensor. No difference. Wow, there are so huge differences between these sensors. And it's not only the engine. You, you speak about a so-called GPS engine and then also the antenna. So the antenna is that thing, this, this thing. And the, the engine is this little chip. It's on the back side. And then you see also a little backup battery here. And um, when you start with it, you go to Adafruit or something like that, and you buy a GPS receiver. And it works. And that's great. But then you take your phone out, and you recognize that even if you have the phone in the pocket, it just takes a second, and it knows where it is. And it's very precise. And if you would like to reach that preciseness with your own built device, you need a really good GPS engine. So, and uh, like I said, I tried five different ones, and I ended up with this. And this is uh, since two weeks I have it inside uh, my device, and it, it works perfectly. But this device is 100 euros, so it's not really cheap anymore. But it's really good. So I tested it yesterday here, and with GPS devices it's like that. Uh, you start it once, then it takes some time to, to recognize all the satellites and calculate the position, and then if you have a good engine, they store that and they store the positions of the satellites, and the next time you switch it on, it remembers, oh, the last time the satellites have been at that position, and now it's this day, so mm, they can calculate the, approximately the, the new position of the satellites, and then they know really fast where they are, if it's a good engine. But if you move in the meantime, so means I switch it off in Germany, I moved here, I switch it on, so it thinks, oh, I'm in Germany, oh, I'm not. So it takes a little bit to recognize the position, and that chip, I was standing beside, uh, between two buildings in a city, in a different country, far away from the, the old location, and it took just 15 to 20 seconds to pick up the location. And that's, that's the difference with the GPS engines. The, the former one had the same engine, but not so, good bet, uh, not so good antenna, and it took 20 minutes to get the signal. So this is really, and if you would like to start running with a device and you stand outside, oh, still no signal. 10 minutes, still no signal, so it's not really convenient, right? So that's the reason why I bought that one. So really good stuff. And you can get that, oh, and the title is not right. Ah, I see that, that's the old one. This is um, uh, csgshop.com, that's the URL, and there you can buy that, and they have lots of GPS systems, and they are really good. So I, I didn't show how to, to get the data, because this is easy, this is a serial port, like you know it from the desktop computer. And if you do GPS, then there's something like NMEA. This is the protocol. And this is just a text protocol. It just sends so-called NMEA sentences. And they are different ones. And they contain, it's just a, a string. It's just one line for each sentence. And then uh, it, it will update these sentences on the UART by standard is once a second. So that means once a second, you get just a couple of sentences, just strings. You have to pass them for location, and, and all the data is inside that string. So it's not very rocket science. So like I said, the code, this is easy to get. Problem is to get the right hardware. Connected to the Pi, also no problem. You just hook it up to the serial, to the UART of the Raspberry Pi, and you can use it from Pi4j directly from the code. It, there's directly something like serial, and this is the, the UART that is uh, available on the Raspberry Pi. So if you would like to track the heart rate, then uh, yeah, that was a little bit different because I started with a sensor that you have to attach to your finger, and then you have a cable running to your device, and you have to tape the cable, right? So uh, it was not very convenient, and if you run around and you have this cable flickering around, and then you have some blinking light on your finger, and uh, that wasn't really a good solution. So I ended up with this one, which is uh, from Polar. I think Polar, most of you might know, is they are really... Uh, well-known in the heart rate tracking scene. So, and they have this little uh, sensor, and it, it's really a very simple device. You need this, the, the, the strap that is available from, from Polar, and then this device will just collect the pulse for each heartbeat. And it's a 15 millisecond pulse, and you just have to hook it up to the GPIO to one pin, because it's just a digital high for 15 milliseconds. And the code to do that is this. So that means you have something in Pi4j named GPIO controller. 
then you get the instance from that, and then you just have to define a so-called GPIO pin digital input because you will collect data from that. You don't want to switch something. You would just like to recognize if it's high or low. And you set it to standard low, pull down. This is pin pull down resistance. And then you just register a listener to that pin. And that's all you have to do. And then each time this device gives a high impulse, you will see it. And then I just call this heart rate monitor beat method. And you see I can use lambdas, which is great, because it saves you a lot of code when you do uh, Java coding with Java 8. And then in the beat uh, method, this is, uh, like I said, this is no rocket science. You, and the interesting part is if you collect heart rate data, then you will recognize that even these sensors from Polar, they don't give you the perfect heart rate. Sometimes it's above 250. Sometimes it's below 20. So you, re you really have to filter and average the values to get something close to reliable, right? So what I do, I just count the, the uh, 10 last beats and then just make a floating average. And uh, I use streams here to do that, which is, which is nice. It really saves you a lot of code, like I said. And I uh, compared that to, to a professional device in a fitness studio. And it was close, so it was two to five beats per minute off, so it depends. Most of the times, it's, it's really close to the original one. So this is, you can do that. And you really just need three wires for power ground and then the, the digital highest pin, and that, that's all. So very simple to set it up. And this is really all the code you need to get that running. <laughs> well, tracking temperature might not be the best device to do that. <laughs> because you know where you have to put it, right? Uh, you don't want to run around with that thing, you know where. But it was just a nice picture, so I thought uh, that was something that I learned, because in the beginning I thought, oh, that might be nice to have the, the temperature of the runner, just to see how it heats up, and if you have a cool down phase, you can monitor that. But in the end, I figured out that is not so easy. So um, I, I do temperature monitoring inside that case, and uh, like with the GPS sensors, I tried four different sensors to do that, and I ended up with this because this is a really, really small one. It's smaller than this area of my tiny finger here. So it's really, really small. And it uses uh, I2C, and again, you can use Pi4J to access that, which is very easy. And it has temperature and pressure. And it has a really low power consumption. And this is uh, something that you really have to keep in mind when working with these de variable devices that are running on battery. This is something, it's it, most important thing, low power consumption. Right? This is even for the GPS. You will find GPS sensors, very cheap ones, and they have really high power consumption. And you will see it in the, in the battery life. So that was also a reason why I chose the, the, the one that I now choose. And this one has really low, it's the BMP-180 sensor, and that has, it's well known for its low power consumption. So the form factor was nice. Uh, it can measure temperature and pressure. Uh, yeah, I figured out measuring temperature inside of this uh, doesn't really make sense, because the temperature will always have an offset of, depends on how long the device is running, so it, it gets warm inside. The GPS sensor will get warm, the CPU and the whole board will, will get warm, so it's uh, this is unreliable. So I also work with an external temperature sensor, but then we have the problem with the cable again. So I had that, and then uh, I had the, the device somewhere here, and then you have the cable somewhere, you have to tape it, and uh, it's, it's not really convenient. I tried the stuff from the medical uh, hospitals, where you have this for the, the EEG and EKG, I think it's uh, electrocardiogram, where they have these tapes where you can wire it, but this is not reliable. If you start sweating and running, then the stuff will get loose, and so it doesn't really work. So temperature is not, not a good option, but pressure was good, because pressure gives you an, an indication of what is the weather like, right? Because you have the, the pressure, and you can see if it's, uh, if it's good, bad, good weather or bad weather, so it's, it, it was some indication that was interesting to have. And I, I won't show code for this one, because it's... Um, because it's I2C, it's uh, more code. And I, I don't want to have four slides of code just to, to show you how to get the data. In, in the end, it's very simple. You can just read it out, but you need more code to do that. With the haptic feedback, I was thinking about how can you do that? If you know how it works, it's a little motor 
and uh, the motor doesn't, it, it's not really round, but it's like, a, like an off-center uh, elliptical thing, and then it starts to vibrate as soon as it rotates. And so I found this one, which is a li so-called lily pad vibe. And the good thing is, it's so easy to access. You just give it power, and it starts vibrating. Take the power off, it stops. So that's all. So what it needs, just li like the, the digital input, you just need a digital output this time. Uh, and then this is the code that I use. Not really, this is just to show how you can do it, because I, I created something like, sentence, like, like sequences, where I can create a sequence. Say, five, five seconds on, one second off, two seconds on, and so on. And then I can just say, play this sequence. But in principle, the only thing you do is, this time, you create a digital output pin, and then uh, standard is low, and then you just set it to high for a certain amount of seconds or milliseconds. That's all you have to do. And then you just have to create your own uh, methods that say, OK, bus for whatever, five seconds, one second. So for example, if I switch it off, it just starts vibrating until it's really off. So I know, OK, now this thing is going off. It's the only way I can really recognize, except watching inside if the LED is off, uh, to, to see that it's really off. So this is uh, how I do the vibrational stuff. So it's, like I said, the code is not the problem with all that stuff. It's easy to do. Uh, this might be interesting. Because I really, I was able to do that. Who did ever text-to-speech on Linux? Did someone try that? The open source stuff? And that's awesome. Sounds like 1980. It's really hard to, to understand. And uh, I tried that. And the problem was when you run around on the street, and the stuff is talking to you. Like, what is it? What is it? Ah, four, it's over. And then, oh, ah, damn it. OK, so I was looking around what I can use. And uh, the idea was the system should tell me my heart rate every minute. That was the start. And if now the, the audio works, and I, I'm not sure how I implemented it. Let's see. No message. Maybe it comes in a second. So the other one was, I would like to send messages to the device. Let me see if I can get it running. Come on. Ah, maybe yeah, I have to try. Um, so it uses these voices from Capstrel or Sepstrel. I don't know. If, does someone know this, this company? They have really high quality text-to-speech voices for all different platforms, different languages, different, um, uh, you have, for example, different people like women, men, and then more than one, so it's really interesting. And one voice they ported to the Raspberry Pi or to this embedded stuff. So I bought this voice, it's 29 euros, and this one is really high quality. So let's try again if it, ah, just damn it. So I, I have an audio recording and you, then you can listen, but it, it doesn't really work here, I don't know why. So um, if you are interested in that, here you will find it. And like I said, I used that for my own um, bug tracking system that I built 10 years ago. And then for certain people, when they put in a, a bug report, the system was talking to me and said, oh, Peter submitted a new bug report. Because I know if he, this guy submits a bug report, then it's a good one. So I would like to know the good ones and the other ones I can check later. So that was the, the main idea. So I knew this, the company for these voices and it's great that they have one for Raspberry Pi. And the problem is, if you go to the, <clears throat> to the website, you won't really find the Raspberry Pi side. That's the reason why I put it here. So you need this link, which is also in the QR code, to, to get the voice. And it's a little bit strange procedure, because you have to write them a mail that you would like to buy it, and then they send you something, how to get that. And um, it comes with its own tool. It's a command line tool called Swift, totally unrelated to, to Apple. And um, sure, you can write your own wrapper for Java and all that. But you know, in Java, we can also do runtime, exec, like execute, and then just execute the stuff on the command line. And that's the whole code I need to let the thing speak. Right? Just say, I send a message, and then call the Swift command with the message, and then it reads it. So it, it takes on the Pi. Uh, we have a latency of around 1.5 seconds uh, before it translates the stuff. But this is not critical, because I just send messages like uh, my heart rate, so I don't need really exact at this point. I'm, I'm happy if it talks at all. And um, the good thing is, 
that I, I told you I can also send messages. So what I do, and I will show it to you later, is I have a, an, a desktop application. And then I can say, OK, to this runner, send a message now. I can type in something. And then it will send the message to the runner, and then it will read it to the runner. This is one thing. Then it also knows always the position of the runner. It gets the weather information for that position. And if there's a weather warning close to the runner, then it will also get this information and will warn the runner and say something like, be careful, five kilometers ahead, north, northwest, will be some thunderstorms, something like that. So we'll, you will get that information from the device too. And then there is another feature, which is, um, do someone of you know own tracks? No one. But who knows Google Latitude? Some. So it's, um, in principle, this is something where you can share your location with your friends. That's the idea. And there is an uh, open source project called OwnTrax, and it uses MQTT as protocol. So that means you can set up your own MQTT broker and then create your own group of the people that you know and that you like. And then you can share your location on a map. So and what I do is I thought about if I have a marathon runner and he's running 42 kilometers, then I have maybe a team of five people standing along the track. All these people have their mobile phones, right? And they just have own tracks open. And just don't even have to have it open. It just said automatic update the location. So and what happens is that as soon as the runner comes close to one of these people, the person with the mobile phone gets a message. The runner is coming 500 meters from that direction. And the runner gets a text message, something like, there is something of your team in 500 meters. And then every 100 meters, he gets an update. So now he's there, he's there. And then you can meet him. So it's. Um, this is just stuff that was fun to play with. So to be honest, I never really used it, just for demos. It was really just a fun project, but it works. So, uh, and I think I like the idea to have something read to the, to the runner. That was a nice idea. So now to the hard part, connectivity, which is uh, really heavy lifting. Because you know, you have, I think all of you have a smartphone. And smartphones in our days are not really telephones anymore, right? This is a computer made for internet connections. The good thing is, all the heavy lifting to get to the internet is done by the phone. The battery life, everything is optimized to stay as long as possible online and all that, that thing. So um, I also tried a version that was totally autonomous. So that means in this box, I also had a 3G modem. And it was connecting to the internet by itself, so I don't need a mobile phone. And then it worked for two hours, which was not enough. Right? So this one now works for seven hours on batteries. And it updates the location every five seconds, which is fine. So OK, first try that I did was Wi-Fi. And uh, the only thing I needed was my phone, open up a private hotspot. Then you need this little adapter for the, for the Pi or for the Odra W. And then uh, you can have uh, a local network, and you can hook up to your phone, and then you can get to the internet. That's very easy. The problem is, in this case, um, sure, the device needs a battery. This is always the case. And uh, the power consumption of Wi-Fi minimum is 116 milliamps. So uh, who knows what milliamps are? OK, because I know this is, this is always a problem. If you have no idea, then yeah, don't care about that. Just believe me that 116 milliamps is a lot. Right? That means if I run that device, I can also use it on, on Wi-Fi. I just have to change the Bluetooth stick and at, the, at the bottom with the Wi-Fi one. Then it runs for three and a half hours. So it really reduced the, the battery life by 50% just using Wi-Fi. And uh, that was the reason why I finally switched to Bluetooth. Because everybody does that. Apple does it, Google does it. So I thought, OK, I will do the same. And uh, so instead of the, the Wi-Fi stick, you just need a Bluetooth stick. So it's, it's very easy to, to set it up. And th the only thing <laughs> that was a little bit strange was how to get the device using the internet connection of the phone using Bluetooth on Linux. And there is this very old thing called PPP. Does some, someone remember that? And that works great, right? It's, it's easy to set up, and you don't have to worry about anything. You just set it up once. You pair this device with your phone, and that's it. And everything else is done by PPP. And then from Java, you just open a connection, and it will directly open it via your phone. And that's uh, all you have to do. So you see the power consumption is at the minimum is 16 milliamps, which is really, really low. 
The heavy lifting is done by the phone, as with the, with the Wi-Fi, of course. And you can use this so-called Bluetooth tethering. And the new phones, phones can do that. I don't know if the older ones can do, but the new phones can. Um, the only drawback might be that the, the throughput is limited by Bluetooth. It's not that big as Wi-Fi, but for this kind of data, it's more than enough, right? It's really every five seconds a message of a few bytes, it's not really a problem. So then, um, if I talk about communication, I'm using MQTT. Who knows what it is? A few. So it's called um, Message Queue Telemetry Transport. It was invented by IBM, I think, roughly 10 years ago, and it was made for monitoring oil pipelines. Sensors that are attached to oil pipelines somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And the problem was that there's really a not reliable internet connection on that positions. So they use uh, publish and subscribe. It's a binary protocol. That means we have really small messages. It's made for, for bad conditions related to, to internet connections. So that was the perfect fit. And uh, <clears throat> to give you an idea, you need a broker. So I uh, use Mosquito, which comes with, uh, with Linux. If you just have uh, Debian, for example, you can do up, get, install Mosquito, and then you have it. And then you have some so-called topics. And then you can subscribe to topics and publish to topics. And if the JRunner publish its methods, its uh, data to the topic, then every client that is connected, subscribed to that topic, will get the message. And if the client sends a text mes message, for example, then the runner will get it via this slash message topic. So you can have your own hierarchy in the, in the messages, in the topics here, and you also have wildcards available. And this is, in principle, the setup. So we have the, the Odroid, use Bluetooth, and then th this cellular connection of the phone to do the MQTT publish. And at home, I have this device, which is also an Odroid. And on this device, I run my broker. So you don't need a really a big server. It's just an embedded device, powerful enough to do that, because I'm, I'm the only one who uses it. And then the, the good thing is you publish from one device, and then you can subscribe from many devices. So I started with a with a desktop client, then I created a mobile client, then for, my smart, for a smartwatch, and then I started <clears throat> also a database server that just subscribes to the topic and stores the data with every message. So it, this is very easy and a very good approach if you use uh, something like this variable stuff, because you have one device that creates data, and then a lot of devices can subscribe to that data and do something. So it's perfect for machine-to-machine -machine communication. It's a really lightweight protocol much better than REST or something. For that devices, you don't need all that stuff. And uh, I also use XMPP. That's some kind of chat protocol, which is XML-based. Even that is too big. And it, it's made for low power. And you, you will find, on the internet, you will find uh, comparison between protocols. And you can really see the battery life is longer when using MQTT compared to, for example, REST calls or XMPP. So that's really interesting. And it supports quality of service. So that means I can make sure that a message that I send to someone, to a topic, that it really reaches the, the broker. I can make sure that it uh, reaches the target. That means the quality of service. And there's a Java library called Eclipse Paho, which is also available for C, for Python, and other languages. But for Java, you, it's, it's also available. And that, that, that's really nice. It works quite good. It's not the newest one, but it's, it's OK. So now, because I have to hurry up a little bit, um, let's take a look at the hardware. That's the device. And you see, it uses the exact same system on a chip than the, than the Raspberry Pi. It's really the same thing. And uh, it has 512 megs of RAM. It has a real-time clock on board. Perfect. It has a battery charger, which is awesome. And uh, you can directly connect a lithium polymer battery to that device, <clears throat> and you can charge it through the micro USB port. So this is really nice, because I don't have to open it. I just put the micro USB cable in and charge it, and then that's it. And it has a 12-bit analog digital converter also on the board. This is additional. The Pi doesn't have that. That makes it really special. And it's really, really small. It's ha nearly half the size of a Pi, so it's really nice. Then uh, this is the setup, and this was the old, the former GPS receiver, which has a really bad antenna. And you see it's a lot of wires, right? So um, you can imagine if you have to solder all the wires inside, it doesn't really work. 
what I did, I created my own PCB and etched that and put it inside. So it's, um, but this is uh, a different story, which, uh, yeah, if I have a longer talk, then I can talk about that, but not now. But you see, you need to hook up all this stuff. It might look, look a little bit confusing, but it's not really hard to do that. Who, who had ever soldered something? Yes. It's fun. You can try it. Even a software developer can do it. It's no problem. So this is the setup. And uh, this is, like I said, this is the old antenna. You see it's not in here anymore. It was here. Uh, now it has the new one. And uh, I have the BLE stick. And here you see my own PCB, the cup, copper thing. This is the vibration motor. And I have to really stick it to the, to, the, to the case. And I have to make sure that it's really, how to say that, isolated from the rest. Because um, the GPS sensor is really sensitive to vibrations which is a bad combination if you have, have a vibration sensor in the same case and it's sensitive and you see it's not really good. And so one word about, uh, about battery life. So there is a simple formula to calculate it. And uh, this is the estimated power consumption of the device. And uh, it, it says it should run for 7.4 hours. And I measured it, but I cut down when the battery is 15%. So I will come around six to seven hours. So it's, that's quite good. The formula works for me. Final setup. This is how it looks. So I have this holster. On the one side, you have, this is made for runners. So it's very lightweight. Unfortunately, my baggage was lost yesterday. So otherwise, I can, could have shown it to you today. But yeah, unfortunately, that's not possible yet. Here's the strap. You put it around your, your breast, and then you have here the mobile phone, the devices here, and then you have just earphones, and then you can put the cable through this, and then you just have a short cable for the earplugs, and then you can plug it in. So that you can really run with that. We tested that with the, with the runner, and he said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, one case, we just had a live runner during the session, and then we can follow him on the, uh, during the session, right? And that was really nice. So I created a mobile app. I use JavaFX on Android and on iOS. So this is just what it does. It shows battery life. This is heart rate. You can tap it here on the map button, and it will show you a static map where you are at the moment. And it shows you the distance and the time you, you ran already. And then you can here, this is the menu. You can swipe it down. It has an alert button. That means if you fall down somewhere, broke your leg, you can set alert, right? You can mark points of interest. You can start, stop recording reset the recording, shut down the device, and exit the application. So this is very simple. It's not really, uh, really something very special. But it's one code base. I just wrote this stuff once. It works on the desktop, on all these devices. And I just compile it once, and then I have it for all devices at the same time. And also on that watch, you can use it. It's, um, and I just recognize if the, the, the display size is different, and then I just reorganize it a little bit for the watch, but everything else is the same. And at last, we have the desktop application. It looks like this. And uh, you see it's packed with all these different features. And I don't want to explain everything, but uh, you see you can here you have a, a gauge that shows the actual uh, heartbeats per minute. It shows the average. Then you can have here track data. That means it shows, OK, what was the average uh, speed? What was the maximum speed? What was the maximum height? What was maximum uh, beats per minute and that stuff? Here you see the if you have teammates using own tracks, they will appear on that side here. And they will also show up on the map. I have different maps available because I use OpenStreetMap. You have all these overlay layers like temperature, rain, wind, whatever you like. I have weather information down here from the location of the runner. And then I have stuff like speed, temperature, pressure, the name of the runner, battery from the device. I can also monitor that and show. Then I have some graphs where I can see the track. Then I see the altitude and heart rate. And you see it's colored. That means I also recognize the heart rate zones, which is uh, interesting because if you run around heart rates around 200 beats per minute, it's not really healthy. So it's good to monitor that. And that's the talk, but I will also, we have one minute. And that's the, the application. And you see a track that I recorded yesterday going from the hotel, which was here. 
I think. And you know, you see the, f oh, it was here, I'm not really sure. And uh, I locked it just to make sure that it worked. And you see, it's not that bad. If I zoom in, then uh, you see it was quite good on the position. And it's between houses and everything, and there have been trees around me, so it's, it's okay. I can uh, color it with heart rate, but the problem was because I don't have my holster with me, I have to hold it like this, which means the connection was maybe not that good. So it's, um, and then you can click on the track, you see, okay, 160 beats, it's not really true because I walked very slowly. But uh, you, it, you see also the accuracy, it's uh, 580 meters, that's the radius. That's what the device has really as accuracy, and you see it was quite accurate. It was directly on the street, and I really was going on the street and changed the, the road at that, at that point, I changed to the right side, so that, that's really nice. Then uh, we have charts, like here you can see heart rate, altitude and that stuff. And then these are the heart rate zones for that walk. So um, I can see, okay, most of it was fitness, but like I said, this is not reliable because I don't have the holster with me. Um, what else do we have? Well, this is weather information, but this is the city where I'm living, so because now I'm not online, it only shows the, the runner location when I'm online. And I guess, okay, we can also use different maps like this, right? So I have, we have also overlays or whatever you like. So there are a lot of maps available. But this is a JavaFX application, and I think we are done, so I have to stop now. Thanks for attending, and if you have any questions, I will be here for a couple of minutes, but then I have to leave, so just uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Thanks.